Reggae interviews. Word sound power. DJ745 for Reggae interviews with a true musical ambassador for both the UK and the birthplace of reggae music, Jamaica. He's got this uncanny knack of seeming together reggae grooves, rhythm and blue melodies with his unmistakable voice. Maxi Priest, how are we today, sir? I'm awesome. It's awesome. It's great to be here. It's good to be alive, man. That's good to hear. Now, we feel really blessed to have this opportunity to hold reasoning with someone that I first saw and heard way back in 1987 when I was just a little kid on Thursday, 7 o'clock, BBC One. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, don't you? No, 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 no. Top of the Pops. Oh, my God. <laughs> Top of the Pops. Wow. That in itself was an achievement, um, or I thought it was like a massive achievement especially from where we're coming from um you know the struggles of life and you know uh growing up in london to be asked or to achieve performing on top of the pops was like wow wow damn maybe something can happen you know mm. yeah you know just I, I guess always been optimistic but um you know in the climate of what we were living in uh all the racism and stuff like that and you know and all the nose and the nose and the nose you can't you can't this and that to eventually uh be able to perform on top of the pops where so many greats from the states uh, you know england itself is a massive melting pot of music mm. and um to be able to be a part of that was you know a dream come true i guess yeah mm. i mean back then i think that for a lot of people in the uk that was sort of like your first point of access to hear new music remember there was no internet there was no spotify yeah. or anything so you know i used to sit there patiently waiting to record the new songs via the video and the audio um just to be able to listen to new songs i guess you know just the mere fact of uh seeing somebody on top of the pops that you can relate to you know somebody that uh came from the similar kind of struggles and and brought up the same kind of way you know to be that when when i used to see like aswad and you know sugar minot and dennis brown and bob obviously on um top of the pops that was like wow that was especially yeah it was it was massive you know it, for us it, that was just um an achievement that um as I said before, we could have only dreamed of, you know. Mm. Yeah. Look, here in 2021, I feel that the music that you're making is even more relevant in this world that we're living in. But I've realized one thing. I don't know the inside story about Maxi Priest. I know that he's this young man from Lewisham that's conquered the world musically. I want to share some memories of yesteryear with our viewers. Mm -hmm. But before we do that, I want to talk about a song which I feel is the number one love song for this year. A song that you've interpreted with Teddy St. John and Taddy P. Oh, yeah. Leave the door open. Leave the door open. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. It's crazy because um, obviously we were going through the COVID, you know, this mad, crazy time that we're living in. And uh, my bass player, Taddy P, uh, called me up and introduced the song to me because I, I'd never heard it, honestly. Um, and he just asked me, you know, would I be interested in um, featuring on this track? And I just thought, okay, you know, just let, let's just have a go. Let's just do something, you know what I'm saying? And um, wow, the response that we've had from it thus far has been amazing, amazing, awesome. Mm -hmm. It's an awesome song anyway. You know, Bruno Mars and uh, who's the other cat? Oh, gosh, they kill me. But... Um, awesome song you know after, since i've done the song i just can't stop singing it it's brilliant, brilliant. is there plans for a video for this new single i w i hope so um <sighs> we're still going through this COVID time so 
everything's kind of up in the air you know you do what you can when you can the best you can you know um, and I guess even more so now seize every moment seize every moment and you know uh, know that it's precious you know yeah mm -hmm. very very true I mean that song that we're talking about leave the door open I still feel that there's still a lot more mileage to go with that song because it's only just starting to bubble in 2021 but you know I think that you know coming into the winter months and into 2022 it's the song that's still going to be being played on the radio and things I, I hope so and um, you know look you, you put a song out there and you just pray God you know I hope everybody appreciates it and um, plays it and and you know just you you can never sit down there and predict uh, anything for a song you you just gotta put your heart and soul into it 100% or more and hope that people appreciate the effort and the energy and the time that you've put into um, the, um, the emotional exchange mm. that you put into a song and hope that people you know have open arms and an open mind to to receive that um, I think there's a lot of mileage in this song why not it's a great song but again I just pray that it does what it's supposed to do supposed to. yeah mm. And I think, like you said, that we're kind of living in strange times. So, you know, I know that touring is starting to come about for people, but we're not in the same world that we were two years ago. So we'll have to wait and see what happens. Yeah. You know, even as we speak here now, you know, I'm on tour. But, um, you know, we, we took a chance, you know, and thus far, thank God, it's been uh, festivals. So it's outdoor and, and everybody's feeling a little bit more relaxed to uh, come to the uh, outdoor situations, which is understandable. Um, we've had fun. It's been awesome. But obviously, we're being careful. You know, we have to, uh, you know, n not so many meet and greets and stuff like that, which I'm sure everybody understands that, you know. So let's just keep our fingers crossed, pray, and, um, you know, God always finds a way. True, true. Yeah. I guess this is a good point for me to actually congratulate you on your Grammy nomination earlier this year for that album, It All Comes Back to Love. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you know, thank you to everybody who supported the album. Uh, a massive thank you to my good friend Shaggy, who uh, produced the album with, um, with, uh, uh, I'm tripping myself here, um, Livingston Brown, uh, Bubblers, um, Wayne, um Shane and the whole ranch crew you know and and everybody who participated on the album um duets killer my son um Shay uh you had some you had some really big collabs on the inner circle Noah Power yeah. Estelle Estelle Hamilton um man <laughs> <laughs> so I want to know how did how did that album come about obviously you and Shaggy have been sparring for years and years yeah. but how did the actual concept to work on an album together first come to light I think it was inevitable really because as you said we've we've been friends for a long long time and uh, you know we work together we perform together we've written many many songs together we've done duets together with ourselves um, so it was only a matter of time and obviously um, a record company with the right investment to be able to support the project you know because yes you can do an album you can do songs but um, it needs promotion you know it needs uh, promotional support and um, you know investment from other people uh, both both uh, monetary but um, energy you know and support mm -hmm. yeah 
Yeah. I mean, that album, it's got 14 tracks. And was it all recorded at Shaggy Studios in Long Island or was some of the work done in Jamaica as well? Most of it was done in the studio, in, um, in Rance Shaggy's studio. Uh, we did a few bits and pieces in England and um, some of it also in Jamaica as well. But awesome. You, you know, it was you know to us it was a no-brainer we, we we were already working on uh material before and it was crazy that um shaggy um met up with um one of the directors at uh, bmg at some party and uh they they had a conversation and all, all of a sudden my name came up and he asked if he could um listen to some of the material and i guess the rest is history History. you know Mm. they they thought it would be a good idea that we put it together as an album yeah yeah we're we're very glad that you did because you know there's there's such a really great mix of songs different types of rhythm so songs like if i was your man um i really like bridge you burn um i'm very much a very conscious kind of lyrics kind of man so i always have to sort of look out for that kind of song yes but you know from day one i've always had a sense of uh variety um even from my days of sound system um i've always wanted to play or create music with diversity uh for me the most important part of it is the art you know i've been blessed to be able to sing and um there's no reason for me wanting to pigeonhole that uh, beautiful talent that I that has been gifted to me. There's no reason for me wanting to to you know pigeonhole that in any particular genre. It's an art that um, is dear to me. It's my heart. It's my soul. It's um, it's my life. It's my heartbeat. Um, it's a spiritual connection that I have uh, that has been gifted to me from my mo- from the Most High, and also through my mother, um, who was a missionary in Pentecostal Church. Uh, that uh, rejoicing and praising, you know, through singing, mm. has always been a part of me from a kid. Um, I've as i mentioned earlier growing up in england is such a massive melting pot of music um i've been listening to r&b rock pop jazz all these different genres of music uh for the appreciation of the art you know um i grew up listening to frank sinatra you know sammy davis jr um Bob Marley, Burning Spear, you know, um Ken Booth, John Holt. Um the list goes on, you know, um Phil Collins, Sting, all these various, various different people because of my appreciation of the art, you know, and my love for uh g- good lyrics and, and expressing the meaning and feeling of Mm. words you know so i've always been very open-minded to do various different styles of various different genres of um, music within the album not only to show versatility but just not to pigeonhole my art true yeah that's just i don't know that's just the crazy me i guess <laughs> i mean look you grew up in south london yeah. lewisham was your family home um, your parents moved from the country in st elizabeth to london in the 1950s late 50s late yeah 50s. late 50s share with our viewers one memory that's really stuck in your mindset even to this day today about your childhood hmm well, my dad passed very, very early, 
I was 14 when my dad passed. And I guess... I don't know. It's, um, there's so many memories. So many memories. But I, I, I think my greatest memory would probably be when my mother passed away. And I, I remember sitting on the doorstep of my house looking in the sky thinking wow you know there's nobody to turn to and ask for advice or guidance or even some money <laughs> you know um, uh, so I, I remember saying to myself you know if I strip myself naked, what do I have to offer the world? You know, um, I don't know where I got that from, but I know I got it from somewhere. What do I, I have to offer the world? Not necessarily what the world has to offer me, you know? And I guess that became my greatest challenge, you know? to um, understand that I have to stand up, you know, and take responsibility of uh, my life. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. And that's what really gave me my fire and, and my drive to kind of go, uh, this is what everybody says I do best. This is what I think I do best. This is where my heart and my soul is. Am I just gonna let it just roll out like that? Or am I gonna grab the bull by the horns and drive it to where I wanna go, you know? And that's, I think that's, that's my most important memory, yeah? Um, if I was to remember other things, I remember uh, being in a crowded house of nine brothers and sisters and other families in what you would traditionally call a three-bedroom house, but we have our way of dividing things, you know, yeah. <laughs> dividing the room into a kitchen, a bathroom, a bedroom, <laughs> a living room, <laughs> and um, I remember just trying to find my own space and um, finding myself under the bed singing, playing with marbles and stuff like that and the whole house looking for me and couldn't find me and there I was sleeping under the bed, you know. It's, it's just, it's difficult to kind of understand today how life was then you know because when when i tell my kids that you know we used to walk in the fog um on the streets of london and you couldn't see further than your arm you know they look at me like huh that's kind of crazy it's hard to relate to. it's hard to it's hard for them to relate to that because um now everything's so bright and so you know <laughs> you know not, not, it's not so foggy um when one thinks of um a paraffin heater you know to heat your house um when one thinks of the color coordination of one's home very dark there was no such thing as a white paint in our house because it couldn't work because, you know, the smoke and the soot from the paraffin heater, you could literally just write your name on the wall, you know. And we were inhaling all of that, you know. That's a whole nother thing, you know. Um, asthma, whooping cough, this, that, you know, people... Um, all these different kind of uh, things that we were not quite aware of at the time, just uh, based on circumstances in life, I guess. Mm -hmm. 
No. We could go on. We I could. mean, we, we we could go on and on and on and on. Yeah. Yeah. You know. I mean, to me, it sounds like you almost had to sort of grow up at a younger age just because of life circumstances, Big the time. passing of your father. Yeah. And like you said, that there was almost like there was this road in front of you and you could have taken the path of music or another career. And it was music that you kind of pushed to. There was so many avenues that we could have drifted off into, you know. Um, it, you know, society at the time was not so kind to us, True. you know. Um, and But I could always hear my mum's voice going, you know, forgive them. Because they're not quite sure what they're doing. Do you know what I mean? Even through the hardest times of people throwing all these different racial names and and stuff like that you know she would she would just open up her arms and no matter which color class or race you may be or whether you're rich or whether you're poor she would bring you in and gather us all around and pray and you know touch people that you don't know from Adams do you know what I mean but that kind of that's helped us you know it's helped us it's helped me a lot you know it's allowed me to walk with no fear you know um, because I believe I have that uh, fearlessness that God is with me you know and my family is with me i have i come from somewhere i'm i have support i'm solid mm -hmm. you know um and yeah you know it, it balance you know yeah mm -hmm. i think like you're saying those family values that have been instilled in you from a really young age stay with you now as an adult and you've probably subconsciously passes onto your own children as well it's, it's like a full cycle yeah but but those are the guidances that i have lived by and i and i truly believe has brought me to where i am mm. yeah okay so while we're talking about family now one of the things i really like to do when i'm talking to artists musicians is to try and sort of like break to break down some of the things that we might be might be a rumor or myth or something now mm. i know that the elliot family has got some really big family connections <laughs> some really big connections right mm -hmm. um jacob miller jacob killer miller um his father and my father two brothers yeah um his dad was also sydney elliot who was also a country western singer who also was in the charts in england also i never knew that yes okay. um he did the song um i'm a little boy blue come blow your horn and um songs like who's that girl in the mini skirt the long-legged girl in the mini skirt <laughs> <laughs> um uh, he was um, a, a, a prolific um, country western singer. Um, you have Fred Locks. Yeah. Um, you have Heavy D. Oh my gosh. Um, Paul Elliott. Paul Elliott. Um, Andrew Priest. And then there's a whole other generation of connections. My son, Marvin Priest. Che. Um, Ian Ryan, uh, Corey Connect, oh my days, my niece, uh, Summers. There's quite a bit. There is, isn't there? Yes, there is quite a bit. <laughs> I guess that's the, um, the greater part of having such a large family. Yeah, big up big to up. my family, loving them. <laughs> yeah, man. Now, sound system, it had a really influential role on people back in the 70s in particular. Um, I know that you touched on some of the racism that we all faced as well. 
Let's let's go back to some of your first involvements in sound system. I'm thinking of the days of Tipitone, Gladiator, which was your own sound. Wow. How did you know about that? <laughs> um, you know, uh, sound system has played such a major role in our existence in this country, of our survival in this country. Um, sound system brought that camaraderie amongst our folks because you know we were very scattered you know but the sound system the blues dance and stuff like that was the place where we could come together and we could reason and understand each other's situations and problems and talk about things and we would learn from each other yeah. you know um, and my sister had a sound system called Tipper Tone, Tipper Tone Hi Fi. Not my sister, her husband. Right, okay. Um, and it just, I was just so intrigued, as we all were as kids, uh, to have a sound system and to be able to bring folks together, yeah. you know? Uh, just, just even when you played your own little gram in your house you know there's gram you know what i mean by gram you know and put your little record on and play your record and obviously so we wanted something bigger than that bigger than what we had in our front room we wanted a sound system so that we could move around and go to different places and meet different people um that's just the way we were brought up anyway um, you can imagine nine brothers and sisters so that vibe just is an extension um, so everybody in in my time wanted to have a sound system uh, we, I, I begged my sister she gave me a, a amplifier speakers and off we were and then um, from there um, with other guys in the neighborhood and school friends we brought some of what they had together and then we had gladiator and then from there to secondary school uh, we met up with saxon saxon Must international must let d row we went to school together um and then i guess every even when i was around my sound system everybody was always and and at school church you know growing up everybody's always touting and saying man i like your voice sing this sing that sing that and then i guess being around Sa saxon allowed me then to move away from uh having the responsibility of creating my own sound system and having more uh time and freedom to kind of think about my singing to be able to present that on stage, stage you know on well on sound system, on sound system. and um yeah so i guess as i move along in life everything has just it's been another step, step you know another progression because of my determination to want to achieve something because I no longer had my parents, mm. you know, so we were all very determined to want to um, make something of ourselves, mm. you know. It does, it, and I'm not saying that, you know, it was we, I was setting out to become no superstar or anything like that. It was just that was my talent, you know. Um, I also. Uh, spent a little bit more time building speaker boxes for uh, Saxon International and also other sound systems um, and then you know I guess the the thing for me was building speaker boxes and then singing on the sound system traveling around England you know north south east west you know manchester birmingham 
and and um Cardiff, yeah Star, you know everywhere. and the list goes on and, <laughs> and then um I, I i guess created myself a a a, a, a groundation mm. you know that by the time i was able to put a song out i mean i was i was signing autographs even before i had a song out you know on sound system and then i met up with um Paul Robinson, Barry Boom. In fact, it was my mother that kept asking him to, uh, you know, somewhat help me with my singing career. I was more studying sound system. But my sister, my mother was on his case, you know. You know, Max can sing, you know, you try and help him with the singing. And um, we got together and um between myself and him and his brothers we uh laid down some tracks and and um created some songs the first song i created was a song called hey little girl uh i remember um pressing a box of of hey little girl and then going back to my community with my crew and everybody and and you know trying to sell them the record and they're like uh can we have one <laughs> 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 so i ended up most mostly giving it, giving away. it away um um and then um we produced the song Sensi and then the song My God my King with right. uh, Philip Levi right. and that was that was just a massive step for us um, Island and various other record companies were inquiring as to what we were doing around the sound system and then we presented the song My God my King they went crazy, crazy. over it mm. um, because that song initially came out on a seven inch on Bad Breed yeah. and then on Level Vibes. And I think I'm right in saying that that was actually the very first song from the UK yeah. to reach number one in Jamaica. Yep. That's, a, that's a mean feat in itself because, you know, Jamaica is Jamaica in terms yeah. of their acceptance of other music. Yeah, because we, 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 were, um, we were used to the music coming, coming in. in. Exactly. You know, and... We just thought that, you know, this this is ours. This is us. You know, because this is our culture. This mm. is this is you, you know, the Rastaman vibration, Jamaica, gave us a sense of belonging. Yes. We are somebody. Do you know what I'm saying? And it, it just made us so uh solid and fierce we were strong we were somebody we had an identity mm. you know um and then you know for us to put that song together it was such a masterpiece of lyric masterpiece of lyric from philip levi to this very day you know that that song will live forever forever you know um i remember he went to jamaica and did sunsplash and he had like a 10 15 minute standing That's observation yeah. you know that that is mad 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 you know and that in itself drove me to the point where i said you know i don't want to go to jamaica until i have something you know that yeah. that I could bring to Jamaica and say this is me yeah. this is what we're doing because I mean you mentioned obviously Sunsplash so back then I think that we probably had bands like Aswad yeah. Steel Pulse but other than that you know for the UK fraternity there wasn't many people that yeah. would be at Sunsplash so you be 40 as well yeah yeah, yeah. you know they, they 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 played a massive part in this industry mm. for us you know and for the world you know um and aswat and still pulse you know these these are true pioneers you know um 
and I, 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 I hold my emotions because unless you grew up here, it's very difficult to truly understand the struggles of where they came from and what they had to go through sure. to to be able to do what they did you know and and it gave people like myself an inspiration and a motivation to want to do something yeah what really strikes me though is that back in the mid 80s you're working with barry bum to try and push papa levi yeah. forwards yeah. yet you're still trying to make that push yourself and it's something you've still done to this day i mean um the name jonathan emil yeah you worked with him literally a couple of years ago on um, babylon is falling so is. to me it seems as though if we take this back to those family values yeah. being able to help people that's something that stayed within you yeah I, you know even uh, Madhouse, I don't, you know Madhouse label. Yep. Yeah, you know I was um, I was partner in that. Um, that was with Janet. Janet Davison, um, David Kelly, Tony Kelly. Um, you that know. was another era, though. That you know that itself, in terms of what those guys did then, never be re reproduced. Very much so. <laughs> Very much so. I remember, you know, us running around um, Kingston, um, you know, studios and stuff like that and, and creating uh, songs and <laughs> it's just mad because um, I bought this MPC 60 and we didn't really know how to use it. And, um, you know, on there there's pads and um, I remember David, you know, just, you know, just playing on the pads and then his brother would just, just dance away. And all of us was like, yo, that's the vibe. That's the vibe. That's the vibe. And, you know, we, we practically left out the traditional drumming because we didn't really know how to use the machine. Oh, okay. And that's really how that uh, madhouse kind of vibe came about. It came about. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. And it was just sheer vibe, good vibe. You know, Daddy Screw, Louis. You know, Terra Fabulous, Spraga. The whole, the list goes on. You know, um, Wayne Wonder. You know, it was. It was just a massive, great time. You know, it was a great time. Was, Jamaica was very different then as well. You know, you, know you, you walk on the streets and the vendors on the streets and they're singing, they're singing, everybody's singing. The, 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 the bus driver's singing, um, the cabman's singing, you know, the person just walking on the street, they're rapping, they're singing. It was just a different, uh, vibe, you know, it was just electrical, but similar kind of vibe was also in England, you know, because you know, a lot of these uh clubs, youth clubs that we used to be able to go to and come together and, and share different ideas and different and create songs and 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 bounce from each other's experiences uh which doesn't really exist now you know um a lot of that has been wiped away which is i think is very unfortunate it's unfortunate for the younger generation coming up because you though you know you had the opportunity to to also sit with people that were older than you you know and you could listen and learn you know that's 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 the true meaning of it takes a village to raise a child do you know what i'm saying it's not just parents because half the time sometimes you know you be, you're almost like a siren to them <laughs> <laughs> do this do that do this do this do, do this do that do this do that do you know and you know we were ch children ourselves you know sometimes I heard it, I hear it, I, I got it. But it takes somebody outside 
to just kind of instill that. Yeah. And then it clicks and they go, you know what? I kind of heard what my dad said, you know, or what my mum said, you know. Um, but I didn't want to give in to him or her, so. <laughs> <laughs> that's too easy. That's too easy. I can't do that. But th that's the um, support of a lot of these youth clubs um, and these centres that, that unfortunately uh, don't really don't exist, exist anymore. And um, a lot of kids are slipping through the cracks. You know, because let's face it, you know, we're living in a time right now where there's a lot of one parent thing going on, mm. you know, and it's, um, we're having our issues with it, you know, we're having our issues and our problems with it. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's sad. It's, it's, uh, it's, um, it's a uh, hard pill to swallow you know um, I just think that we need to somewhat uh, come together a lot more and help each other and and also within helping each other also one also has to accept help you know what I'm saying because giving help is one thing but accepting is also another thing so just be a little bit more open-minded to um, and a little bit more compassionate to what uh, to other people may say sometimes you the words don't come out so clear but um, if you give it time then you know you'll figure it out you'll figure it out yeah I mean I completely agree with some of the things that you're saying about life in the 70s the 80s the 90s it's very much different to what we're going through and the kids of today's generations go through yeah. there was this point where you moved from being with Saxon mm -hmm. to being signed to Virgin I want to understand that journey I believe that there was an Erskine Thomas that was very influential yeah. in that pathway Erskine Thompson um, who uh, we need a lot more of Erskine Thompson in this uh, day and age you know somebody who could understand the you know connecting the bridge the, the communication the cross over to other from one culture to another culture um, you know, it's 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 good for business. It's 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 uh, it's good for expanding one's self and mind, and also being able to share the music on a wider scope. You know, um, yeah, um, we were on sound system, and uh, Paul told me about this Erskine Thompson wanted to talk to me. And he was interested in what we were doing around um, the sound system. Um, and he said, I remember we had a phone call and he said if we could meet. And he told me about London Records, uh, Virgin Records, Ireland, and various record companies were interested in what we were doing. And um, I didn't know anything about contracts or anything like that you know um, well what am I really saying here basically um, you know he, he guided us through our first contract wasn't the greatest but um, we signed to Virgin Records and I was like wow we get paid for this <laughs> you know <laughs> And what you were you were probably what in your early twenties back then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. early twenties. Um, you know, it wasn't that much money, but somebody paid us to actually go in the studio and and do what we love to do, and um, we put some stuff out and we had some success, and then you know that put us into a situation where we could renegotiate and and move along but you know I don't I don't even think that I can really um, 
fully explain the extent of uh, support that uh, somebody like Erskine Thompson did for people like myself, Barry Baum and Lou Sands and Carol Thompson and so many, uh, Diana King, Handel Tucker, so many people, Sly and Robbie, so many people in this industry. You know, we truly miss uh, Erskine Thompson. Yeah. That debut album that you're talking about was called You're Safe. That was back in 1985. Um, we've kind of touched a little bit on Jamaica, but I want to sort of take you back to that point when you, as a young man, is flying out to Jamaica for that very first time to work with the mighty Sly and Robbie, Sly Dunbar, Robbie Shakespeare. I'm thinking there must have been a, a wealth of emotions, nerves maybe even, working with you know some of those legendary you know we've had their productions for years and years so as a youth you've been used to artists coming over dennis gregory barrington levy frankie paul alton ellis now you're going out there to record yeah i mean i have truly been blessed every step along the way you know but i didn't probably didn't realize it at the time you know i grew up with a lot of uh, friends that went to school with uh, Dennis Brown and Gregory so I was somewhat being groomed by a lot of those guys uh, from uh, Negus Nagar sound system uh, Fat Man Everton Bell Prince the twins the Palmer twins uh, so many, you know, Lush, Jubai, too many names to mention, mm. you know. Um, I was being groomed. As I said, I, 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 don't, I don't think I was really conscious of that fact at the time. I had met Dennis Brown even before I um, sung on Plastic. You know, um, but when I started to record and I eventually put out the first album, um, I was just adamant that, as I said before, I didn't want to go to Jamaica until I had something that I felt, you know, I could present and say this is me, this is me. you know um, by that time um, I met up with uh, Matthew and Floxy um, they were very much a part of my life in the music world um, because I also brought them to Jamaica so I remember I spent a lot of time writing here in England Raymond Simpson with the song How Can We Use Pain um, by Boom uh, various other people that I was writing with at the time because I wanted to get all my ducks in a row before we left to go to Jamaica now you have to understand I have never recorded with them before so I don't know I don't know what to expect don't know how it's gonna go but as I said to you we walk with no fear right so I'm pulling Matthew and Floxy and I'm <laughs> and I'm pulling everybody together with Erskine you know um, a guy called Duncan on keyboards we brought with us and said you know what we're gonna go as a team to Jamaica and we're gonna deal with the situation that's it as it comes, comes there and we went to uh, Stony Hill Studios um, uh, and uh, we had Sly and Robbie and Willie Lindo as the producers for the album but we written a whole load of songs and we sat and we said you know Sly and, and uh, 
the crew. Um, let's run through the songs, see what you feel, you know, and, and they were like, yo, nice, like it, love it, love this, love that, love this, boom, boom. And then um, I completely shocked them by asking them for Beres Hammond because uh, um, I, I can't remember the name of the song but there was a song that um, Beres used to sing that we used to play in the dance late early in the morning times after all night raving, raving. <laughs> you know, the the chill out time. You know what I'm saying? The sun's coming through the window. The, you know, the windows all, we've got paper all over the windows and all of that, you know. <laughs> and, and the sun is breaking through. But there was a song that Beres used to um, sing. Please forgive me, I can't remember the name of the song. Um, uh, and I said, you know, do you know this singer? I want this singer here. Yeah to sing this song with us. And I remember Beres come up to the studio and um, you know, looked at the lyrics and everything like that. And he was like, yeah man, let, you know, let's, let's do this. And that was uh, the birth of How Can We Use The Pain? Mm. Yeah. What's funny though is that obviously Beres and Willie Lindo, they've been working together for years and years. So you couldn't have asked for another singer back then. Well, you know, that's my connection to uh, singers. Yeah. And the singer that I thought was the singer in Jamaica Perfect. for me. Yeah, yeah. You know, don't get me wrong, I, Dennis Brown is my idol. Dennis Brown is my singer. But I just loved what Beres was doing, his versatility, you know. There, Beres is more like a soul singer. Right. Do you know what I mean? It, 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 you know, to me, Beres is a singer, just singer. It doesn't, you know, you can throw anything at, at Beres and he'll, he'll shape it. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that Beres is not a, not just a reggae singer. He's a singer. He's a singer. You know, and and I had that mindset from word go anyway. Mm. So I just thought this this man can handle this junior. And so said so done. <laughs> you know, so done. so done. You know, I was, I was, I had to, I had to go back in and do my verse because of what he did, he did. with his verse. I was like, yo, Sly, I gotta go back and do my vocal on that. No, nah, man, you're good, man. Everything good, man. It nice, man. Nope. No. I'm. You know, see what the man do, me. <laughs> 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 I was like, yo, his coloring, his um, melodics, pronunciation, it's not too many. It's in a class of its own. Not too many. <laughs> not too many. <laughs> yeah, not too many. Uh, you, you know, and he's an inspiration to sing with. You know, so, so allow him and then listen because it's not all of us is kind of first-hand gifted like that like that true you know he's just like <laughs> he's like, all right bear all right all right all right all right bear <laughs> you know but love love bears love him love him um but um also, you know, um, working with um, Sly and Robbie and Willie Lindo was just a 
total dream come true. It was a massive experience. It was like, I guess at that point I thought, I felt like I had achieved something. You know, you have to understand, even though I had hits and all of that in England, strolling on, should I, you know, whatever, you know, I felt like I achieved something because I was going home and going to the root of it and somewhat passing a test, I mm. guess. And it's in that trip that somewhere the inspiration to cover the Cat Stevens Wild World came about. <laughs> Who was, was that something that you wanted to do? Was it some of your team? Was it the label? Where did the inspiration come from? Erskine kept saying to me, I got this song for you. And you'd be like, yeah, 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 I got this song for you, man. And I'm like, radical as hell. I ain't singing that song, man. Don't like that song. I bent up my face. I'm not singing that song. All the way on the plane, I'm playing him all of my songs them. <laughs> and I'm saying, I'm not doing that song. I don't care what you want to say, I ain't doing that song. And everybody, everybody around me, even mafia them be like, just try it, try it, try it, you know. It wasn't really until I was in the studio and Shakespeare is up in Big Vice and said, my old try the chone, a big chone or not. <laughs> big chone. And Sly said, yeah man, big chone. Willie Lindo. Do the chone, my old big chone. And for me, I, I, I never saw it until Sly rolled off. One, two, brah, brah. And I could hear the groove of the song, but I sung that song very reluctantly, you know, even at the end of it. I'm not even, gonna, I can't even tell you what I said at the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, baby, baby, whatever, whatever. You know, at the very end of it, I said something that, you know, and they said to me, we're keeping that. We're keeping it on tape. Are you say it, we're gonna keep it on tape. <laughs> I can't even repeat what I said. <laughs> But, um, thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, you know, to Erskine Thompson, Shakespeare, Sly, Will Lindo. Um, his kid was there actually when I voiced that song. Kashif. 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 He was in his lap. When I was voicing that song, Wild World, he was sitting, laying in his dad's lap. Wow. <laughs> behind the, the, the console. For him then to come and do the song again himself. Um, yeah, it was, it was, you know, and I said, um, uh, Mafia and Foxy was also there as well. Um, it was a, it was a, it was the first time for them also, you know, so we went around meeting their family and, and you know, they met my family and we were experiencing Jamaica together. And it was just crazy because every, when I got there, everybody thought I'd born there. Everybody kept saying, yo, what? you were born now. <laughs> you know, it's like, because, I don't know, I guess because of all the stories that, um, was told to me from a child, from my my parents, and then also, as I said earlier on, um, I grew up with uh, Yardman that that grew up with Dennis Brown, Gregory, mm. Errol Dunkley, you know, all these different cats that um, I was being groomed, but I didn't realize it. Yeah, it's, um, it's, <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it's funny how things work out, isn't it? 
it really is it is it's it's it's, um wordless you know it's difficult sometimes to even even remember some of the things you know um because also I'm i'm a kind of kid who just i move forward i don't keep malice I don't hold on to bullshit. And I guess because I've I've got that kind of skill, it also makes me forget some of the good stuff too. You know what I'm saying? So um I guess you can't have it all. You just got I just like to just keep pushing forward. Forwards. Forward and just um I feel like um you know, life is so short. It's so short that um I just want to make the most of every th- situation and just uh, build a legacy but not necessarily I don't even want to use the word build a legacy I just want to push so that when the next generation comes then they can push it that much further again and then that's why that's the way that I feel like uh we can then say we we are achieving because um even in this wonderful world that we're in today and this you know good situation that that some of us a lot of us are in uh there's so much more to do there's so much more to do um there's so much more to understand and there's so much more to do and there's so much more for others to understand about us you know i i still don't feel like there's a level playing field so so that in itself is a fuel to my fire so sometimes when you ask me these questions like I'm, my brain i'm just rattling my brain trying to remember some things because i have done quite a bit and um you know in in doing quite a bit i've had to stay up all night long in many cases and then you're tired and and then you know you go somewhere and you spend two days and then bam you go somewhere else the next two days and then somebody says to you what's it like in san francisco and you kind of go uh nice hotel <laughs> 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 I, I i hear you i i think that um what i see though is that you're still putting smiles on people's faces you know you're here in the uk presently you've been doing some tours over the summer um it seems like that passion that drive is still there within you yeah th- because like i said to me life is short and i just want to make the most of every day and also uh an encouragement to to the younger generation to say there there is a light at the end of the tunnel there is you can achieve anything you want you know I, i'm i don't i don't think that it's impossible for there to become a black prime minister in this country i don't think that's impossible you know and i my kids and would tell you i preach that to them every day every single day you know it is such a great time an opportunity for um for these young kids to leap regardless of the stumbling blocks and the difficulty that we face you can achieve anything you want but you have to sacrifice and you have to put the time in that's that's you know i don't i don't think i can um echo the, echo that enough and then um i feel like uh you by your actions you set an example Mm. Yeah. Do you feel that the opportunities that are there for 
musicians now are more open compared to let's say what you went through as an artist back in the 80s i'm not quite sure about that okay um they say too much of anything ain't no good isn't it you know and um back in the day if you got up off your ass and did something something could happen and because there wasn't so much easy access to it it had a value yeah and uh, an appreciation sorry an appreciation for it you know um, that then makes uh, that then helps people to focus and then helps it to grow right if we fast forward and we are here today it is easy to go in your bedroom and use the machine and everything and create a song and create a good song but then every single house on the same street is doing that and they're putting it out there then now so the audience now is spoiled they have too many things to choose from so it's like being in a chocolate factory you know which piece of chocolate do you eat so we you ever heard them say you Clyde you Clyde or something it's kind of um, it's kind of like that you know too much of something and that I think is also the that's also pressuring the business itself because uh, the audiences now are more divided you know, I like this I like that 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 whereas back then we had this genre that genre this genre that genre this genre okay cool you know what I'm saying to share amongst the world now you have grime dime mime sime lime <laughs> so many different names i don't even i don't even know half of the names you know um i don't know. I, I guess even if i just made up a name you'd probably think it's a genre <laughs> <laughs> Jazz rock. <laughs> <laughs> we could be onto something here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you, you see what I'm saying, yeah. and and that's that's. Um, I'm not quite sure if it's easier now than then, or if it's better now than then. I'm not sure. I'm not sure because um, number one, you know, you have to be on social media every single day and if you're not on it for a month they say where you been you know where you been what happened you know you're back um it's it's um we are yet to work out what uh the entertainment business is today I don't think anybody can actually sit down and tell you this is the entertainment business today. I think anybody who says that to you, I don't think they fully understand the entertainment business. You know, because um, it, it's it's the entertainment business is trying to find itself right now. That's my opinion. I mean, it's opinions. You know, I. I, I um, record companies now you know back then they were this big they're now this big you know um, half the people in the record company are not 
necessarily musos. They are uh, techs who like music or even love music. But they're, you know, that, and look, I'm not fighting it. I'm just saying, you just, you asked me a question. So I'm trying to give you the best answer that I can give you. I, I'm not sure whether it is easier or harder today because, um, you, you know, you put out an album back then, you could take the time for the album to soak and while it's soaking you're building a, 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 a tour then you get up and then you carry it to that country for the very first time you know and and nowadays that bubble is burst before you even get there you know so it's, it's you know just remember back when bob came to england you know, and he was on Old Grey Whistle Test. Whistle test yeah. yeah, it was like, everybody is at the TV. Wow, a Rasta man on TV. He looks like me. He's Jamaican. Wow, you know. Um, you know, and then you go to school and everybody's talking about it and we're all in tuned to that whatever it is that thing you know what i'm saying so we now help to grow it mm. you know if i can imagine going to school now and then everybody's bringing different things you know what i'm saying and then, and then you, so i can't keep up with that that this that 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 and this you know what i'm saying so like i said that um you know, it, it gets less here, less there, less there. Yeah. I hope I've explained myself. I think you, you have, know. I think. Yeah. Well, look, we could talk for hours and hours because yeah. there's so much more that we could talk about in life. But I just want to give thanks for your time today because you've just shared some insights into just a few things in your life and career. I know we're going to do a part two to this as well, but <laughs> yeah, why not? I, can't, I can't close this interview without actually mentioning the album that you put out last year, United States of Mind. Oh man, Robin Trower, Robin Trower. If, you know, one of the top 10 all time greatest guitarists, you know, uh, you know, for those who don't know Robin Trower, you know, people like Eric Clapton, you know, Paul McCartney, people like that would come to his shows. Mm. Uh, I met um, Robin through a mutual friend, producer, co-worker, um, Livingston Brown, um, in the studio in, in Brixton. I was coming out, he was coming in, um, Livingston introduced us, uh, uh, we got talking, found out we came from the same area, um, and we just said, you know, hey, let's kick it let's try it. let's just try something we uh went in the studio man what a craftsman you know just you know just chords and chords just the way he played just kind of give you goose pimples man um and every we just clicked you know you have to understand also livingston was kind of keeping us apart because he didn't understand how it would connect and okay. then um, that made it more intriguing for me to make it work because it was something new. We're gonna do something new. We are gonna create a room where we can make as many mistakes as we want and no boundaries, no, it's gotta be reggae, no, it's gotta be rock, no, it's gotta be blues, no, it's gotta be R&B, no. Let's just do something and see what comes see what from comes our from heart and soul. And, you know, it's state of mind. It just, it's an album that I sit down and play, you know, for myself. Um, I am so proud of it. We are also talking about doing another one. Um, and also, you know, 
an, another opportunity and chance to show my versatility um, and my appreciation for music and not necessarily any kind of genre of music just music you know and, and allowing my art to breathe to find a new life a new survival you know um, and then being able to work with Livingston in that project again amazing awesome you know his skills beyond you know um, you know him putting the orchestras together and and putting everything together just 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 a awesome time awesome time and and you know it may not be for some but for those who have a kind of open mind for music and just great songs they'll appreciate it i think that they will appreciate it you know and i've i've i have gained so many different people from that alone mm. you know oh, since i put that out over the covid you know um over the covid period time um my numbers on my facebook and all of that is gone you know it's gone up so thank you you know what, 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 what more do you say because that that's always been the thing for me i just want to bring bring people together this is a part of that same road that marcus garvey spoke about Martin Luther King spoke about, Muhammad Ali spoke about, Bob Marley spoke about. It's all part and parcel of it, bringing people from all different walks of life together. Mm. Yeah. Well, look, once again, thank you so much for your time today. It's been an honor. I have to say a special shout out to Dino Music Media Management for making that connection as well. Diana. Yeah, man. Enough respect. Thank you. Give thanks. One love. Cool. 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 Reggae interviews. Word sound power.